Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to our video series on building a racing simulator. Now, when playing racing simulators, there are two things that really drive me nuts. The first one is multiplayer mode. You've qualified first, you're on pole position, you're turning into turn one and somebody just cannonballs you from the rear end. Now, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that we can do about that, but the second scenario that really pisses me off about playing racing games is this one. Now, regardless of the simulators or games that you play, it's this is a this is a really common problem. So, you need to change engine modes, you need to change ERS settings, or you know brake bias or wing adjustment things like that on the fly, and you're trying to adjust them with your steering wheel, and you end up crashing because you're taking your attention off what you're doing. Now, in the real world, obviously drivers have buttons that they can use to adjust these things, and they can do it sort of by feel. So they know where the button is, they know how many clicks they need to turn it, and they don't really need to take their eyes or their attention off the action. Now, with my old setup, say my Logitech G27, for example, you've only got four or five, or what was it, it was six, six or eight buttons down the sides, and that was basically all you had on the wheel to adjust things on the fly. So it made it very, very difficult. Now, thankfully, on the Fnatic Formula GT wheel that I've got now, we do actually have a rotary encoder, and a bunch of buttons that we can use to configure things, but I do still find that I've got to go through menus and you know, I do still need to take my eyes off the action to see what's going on. I can sort of configure one thing to happen automatically off the um, off the rotary encoder here, but if I want to change multiple settings, I need to go through the menu and actually select the option that I want to change and then change it. So thankfully, the solution is actually pretty simple and I've built this very simple 32 function button box, which hopefully is going to solve the problem for me. So. 32 functions in that it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 buttons. Now four of these are two-way, so up and down for different functions, so that gives us 20. Then we've got four more functions here, so one, two, three, four button presses on our rotary encoders, and then two-way adjustability on each of the rotary encoders as well. So clicking up will change it in one direction, clicking down will change in the other direction. Now I found the instructions to build this in another YouTube video by another Australian channel called AM Studio, and I want to give them a quick plug because they, they do a really good job of their videos. They're very, very thorough, very, very easy to follow, and they made the process of building this very, very, very simple. So my intention here is definitely not to steal their thunder. I'm gonna link above my head for you right now to the DIY video that I used to actually put this together. But what I wanted to cover in this video is just quickly running you through my actual experience assembling it following their instructions. Uh, obviously, they've got the circuit diagrams, they've got the parts list, and I will include a parts list for you in the description of this video as well for all the parts that I used, because I use slightly different parts to what they did because the availability was a little bit simpler. I ended up just going to JCAR Electronics and picking up all the bits that you see in front of you right here now. So really nice and simple. I'll link all of those in the description for you. But like I want you to watch their video to actually get the assembly instructions because I don't want to pull views away from their video because they did a really awesome job of that. But at the same time, I do want to quickly run you through my actual experience assembling it and all the little bits and pieces that I came across. Now I am an experienced electrical technician. I worked with a soldering iron for five years. Uh, pretty much every day, so I'm pretty good at this sort of stuff. That said, I am a little bit rusty. I haven't done it for a long time, but I found the build relatively easy. For somebody who's not experienced, you might actually be better off just buying one of these directly from them. Now, it is a couple of hundred dollars, depending on where you live in the world, but the reality is the parts to actually build this ended up costing me about $140 anyway, plus it took a good sort of two, three hours to get everything laid out, get everything assembled and all configured and everything. So. Kind of comes down to whether you think you're better off just buying it from them as it as it is, com completely assembled, or whether you actually enjoy doing, um, you know, enjoy the challenge of actually building something like this yourself. But what we'll do now is I'll run you through the process of actually building it, putting it all together, and then later on in the video we'll plug it into the computer, get all the software configured, get the Arduino module flashed, and show you how we're actually going to configure it to all work in the game how we want. So let's get stuck into it. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is lay out all the components onto this grid pattern that you can see here. And basically that allows us an easy platform for cutting and drilling. So lay everything out exactly the way you want. This is really up to you how you do it. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but obviously you want to make sure that things are as symmetrical and tidy as possible. So we just mark the positions of everything that we want and then we move on to drilling. So start off with a small pilot hole for each component and then drill out or bore out the hole to the correct size for the component. So obviously some of them are gonna be larger, some of them are gonna be smaller. So just use common sense there to make sure that all the holes are the right size.
Now in my case, I didn't have a drill bit big enough for some of the buttons, so I had to use a file. And then we just mount the components in. Try to also lay out the terminals so they're all symmetrical as well. All right, so we've got all of our components mounted in the control surface now and our knobs connected, so everything's there. Now what we need to do now is unpackage our little control module, which looks like this. And basically all it is is just a little interface which takes all the inputs from the various different buttons and the rotary encoders and then plugs into USB converts it to a USB signal which is then interpreted by the computer as a input device and we'll obviously cover that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on in the video how that's all configured but so yeah basically we're going to run all of our leads in here and then run it all back to this little control board and we'll go from there so since it is a matrix pattern and not a parallel or serial connection the wiring is a little bit weird and again refer back to the wiring diagrams given in the AM studio video I'm not going to give them here because I don't want to have you guys not watch their video I don't want to steal views away from them because it was such a good video but basically what I want to talk you through here is basically just the technique of doing all this so what I generally do is I use um, I use kit wiring so it's a nice thin wiring with lots of strands there so it's not too flimsy not too fragile having multiple Multiple strands makes the solder take a little bit easier and you can see here that I'm getting plenty of heat into the actual joint as well that's the one number one mistake that people make when they're soldering is they don't get enough heat into the joint so you want to heat up the joint and then run the solder onto the joint don't sort of melt the solder onto the soldering iron and then try to dab it onto the joint that's the number one mistake that I see people make you don't end up with a clean connection and obviously with this much wiring going on, this much cable spaghetti, which you'll see in a few minutes as we start to add more wires, it can get very, very, very difficult to diagnose dry joints or dodgy joints. So you really want to make sure that your connections are solid right from the start. Now, PCBs are basically the same again. You push the wire through and get a bit of heat into the joint, not too much heat in this case, and then just run the solder onto the joint itself, not onto the soldering iron. And if you do it this way, you shouldn't have any problems. Now also, you'll notice we're not bothering with heat shrink in this regard as well. It becomes a little bit too difficult to work with in this case, and because this is gonna be a sealed unit that we're never going to open up again once we've tested it's all working, I really didn't see the need to heat shrink all the connections. But you can do that as well if you want to. But you can see here, it adds up pretty quickly. And this was, up at this point, we've fast forwarded through probably about an hour and a half of wiring and again that's for somebody who's a pretty experienced electrical technician so you know I'd expect that if this was if this was your first time with a soldering iron it's going to take you at least two or three hours to get this all good um, you know obviously the more experienced you are the faster and um, more easy it'll be for you but yeah look it, it's not a it's not a simple build by any means it is just simple connections but because of the intricacy and the amount of wiring that you have to do to get it all working it does take a bit of time so frustration levels can rise but um, yeah look just take your time be patient with it and you shouldn't have too many issues so you can see here I'm just finishing up the last few connections to the rotary encoders and now we're just sticking it to the back side of the front panels just so that we don't have any movement of the wires while things are while things are being put together or while we're using it and then we've also tied a knot in the USB cable and threaded it through the back so that kind of works as a bit of a strain relief so if the cable gets tugged it doesn't tug on the PCB itself and then once we've done all that we simply put the lid on put the screws in and we are ready to start testing it. Okay, so open up your browser and go to Google and type in Arduino IDE, which is the software that you're gonna be using to actually program the Arduino. So click on the first link here, and then scroll down to download the software. So obviously depending on the platform that you're using will depend on the link that you click here. Now you can choose to make a contribution to the Arduino project or you can just download. In this case, I'm going to just download because I've actually already made a contribution previously. And then just click on get and that will download the software. So once it's installed, open it up and then you're going to want to load the sketch file that you can download from the AM Studio uh, link in their video. So load that up here. So once you've loaded the sketch, close the old window, go to tools, and you need to select the appropriate board and COM port. So select the Arduino Genuino Micro and the COM port that coincides with the board as well. It'll change depending on your system. Then we just hit the upload button 
it will read the card, flash it to the card, and you'll hear it disconnect from the PC. There you go. And it should reconnect again. And that's pretty much it. So now we just need to test that all the buttons are functioning. So jump into control panel and type in game up the top. Click on set up USB game controllers. And you should see in your window, Arduino Micro show up there. So click on properties. And this little area here where the buttons are showing up, you can see there's 32 buttons there. All we need to do now is just go through each of the buttons on our controller and make sure that each one lights up. So it doesn't matter what numbers correspond with which buttons because what we'll do is we'll actually program those in into the game or into our emulation software later on anyway. So really doesn't matter what number corresponds with what. All we need to know here is that just every single button is actually functioning correctly and lighting up. So go through and test all of that. And once you're happy that everything's working, we can move on to actually setting it up within the game itself. All right, so time to actually get it set up and try it out inside a game. So what we'll do is we'll use F1 2018 again because it's the game that I've been using for the rest of the video series. Obviously, the settings will be a little bit different depending on the uh, depending on the game that you want to play, but um, you know it's going to be roughly the same kind of idea or same concept as this anyway. So we're going to control and calibration schemes, and you can see here we've got a bunch of presets that are automatically detected. For our um, for our system here, so we're going to jump into the F1 um, preset here for the Club Sport wheelbase version 2.5, which is the wheelbase that I've got here, and we're going to edit. And now most of these out of the box are pretty good. Uh, what we're interested in here is the MFD setting. So MFD multifunction display is where we actually adjust settings on the car on the fly while we're driving. So by default, we want the button to actually bring up that menu to be the rotary encoder on the wheel when we click it. And then, so we'll click it to bring up the menu and then we can navigate through the menu using the directional buttons. So up, down, left, right, and so forth. So then what we want to do is scroll across to MFD shortcuts and this is where the magic is going to happen. So you can see here we've got a bunch of different um, configurations here. So we've got car setup panel, pit setup panel, car damage panel, car engine state panel, and car temperature panel. And those are the different panels that show up in the bottom corner. We'll show you that once we're inside the game. But um, so th those are what show you the vital statistics about the car. And then below that, you've got your fuel mix, increase, decrease, brake bias, differential, and ERS modes. So those are what we want to be able to adjust on the fly. So what we can do here is we'll go assign. We'll assign the first one to the first button here. Pit setup can be this one. Car damage panel can be this one. Engine stat panel can be this one. Car temperature can be this one. And then for fuel mixture increase, we're going to go up. For decrease, we go down. Brake bias, up. Brake bias, down. Diff increase, up. Decrease, down. And ERS, up. Whoop, <laughs> made, that, made that wrong, clicked the wrong button. ERS up, and then ERS down. So it's as simple as that. That's configured that all now. So when we go into the game now, we'll be able to use those buttons and those rotary encoders to adjust those settings completely on the fly without having to go through any menus at all. So let's test it out. Okay, so we're here in Grand Prix mode. Now I'm gonna show you quickly what the buttons actually do in a real world scenario. And then we'll actually go into doing some racing and see whether it makes a difference. So normally what we would have, and I'm gonna have to kind of keep the car moving as we do this, just so that I don't get a black flag. So forgive me for being a little bit kind of clumsy. But the way it stood before without the button box, basically what we'd have to do, and I'm just gonna let the other cars go past me, but if we wanted to change engine modes or ERS modes or anything like that, we'd have to press on our rotary encoder, bring up the menu over here, and then we'd have to kind of scroll through and change things as we went there. So it's very kind of, you press the button to scroll through the menus, and you can see I'm, even at this speed, I'm struggling with it. So you'd press it, scroll through, and then you'd kind of have to choose up and down, left and right, to kind of go through and select various different things. So it was very clumsy because you had to keep on looking over here and to see exactly what you were doing and kind of interacting with it. Not really what you would do in the real world. On the, on the real world, obviously, as you can see, they've got all the dials just kind of there on the wheel, so you can just turn things and adjust as you go. And they do it all by feel. So what we have now, we'll just start it. Well, actually, might as well just keep going here. So what we can do now is if we press the first button here, it brings up our console where we can adjust our brake bias, differential, and so forth. We press the second button, brings up our repair console. Third button is our tire wear and temperature. Fourth button is our engine condition. And then the fifth button is all of our temperatures for the various different parts of the car. But the really cool thing is now we can just go like this, 
to adjust our ERS. So hot lap, overtake, high, medium, low, and so forth. Differential adjustment, brake bias adjustment, and engine mode. So let's see how that actually performs in the real world now. So obviously at the start of a race, we start off with everything cranked all the way up, and then by about lap two or three, we generally have to crank it down. And again, Jeff will give us a call over the radio and say that we need to decrease our ERS mode. So we'll restart the race now. All right, so no pressure or anything. We'll try and get a good start. Oh, see how we go. Oh, this isn't too bad. We are playing with the difficulty set to, I think, 90 or 95 for AI, so it's not going to be the easiest. We'll probably get drafted down the straight, I would imagine. We've got our modes, so everything's, we're on hot lap, and we've got our fuel, we might set our fuel to rich, just to try and get a bit more. Oh, you can see Raikkonen's coming up beside me. <laughs> Keep him behind, so we're in rich fuel trim at the moment. probably go back to standard and already I've made a couple of adjustments there you can see this is moving around on me because it's not fixed yet and I'll obviously have to fix that because it makes it quite tricky but I can pretty much guarantee you I would not have been able to make those adjustments previously without putting it into the wall or spinning or at least losing a lot of time because I have to take my attention off exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to go to maximum fuel down the straight again to try and get a bit of an advantage over their draft. And that does seem to help. He's not able to pull past me like he would have otherwise. Oh, a bit wide. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's going to get the draft on me this time, I think. Oh, how are we going? Well, maybe not. I'm not going to be able to leave it in rich mode forever. We'll go back down again after this turn, I think. Alright, so back to standard fuel trim. Oh, he's up me. <laughs> How much actual... So we do have, actually have a bit of fuel in reserve there. I probably could leave it enriched for a little while, but that's all right. Go back to rich again for the straight. Now I am running out of ERS as well by the end of the lap. Oh, he's just hit me. <laughs> oh, he spun me. No. <laughs> oh well the downside of AI but I think that was a pretty good indicator that I was able to make adjustments on the fly there without putting it into the wall I lost a bit of concentration reaching down might be a bit better to sort of have it somewhere around here where it's just a very small movement but um, we'll play around with the settings later on try to get it in exactly the right spot but I think that's a pretty good indicator as to what it's going to be like so yeah I'm happy with that Okay guys, so that is how I built and configured my 32A switch box. So obviously I still need to mount it onto the rig permanently, get it all fixed into position, but there's a bunch of other stuff that I still need to do there as well. I want to show you how I've got my USB hub mounted, how I've got all the wiring done and tidied up, that sort of thing as well. So we'll probably make that a separate video, but look, in terms of the actual construction of the unit itself, 
I probably rated about a 5 out of 10 in terms of difficulty for me. But remember again that I am an experienced electrical technician with you know many years of experience using a soldering iron. For, so for somebody who's less experienced or maybe hasn't used a soldering iron before, it's probably more like a 10 out of 10 to be honest. It is quite complex, especially as you can see in the video, it gets quite fiddly with all the various wires that you've got to have in place and quite tight, quite a tight space to do so. So look, definitely worth considering purchasing one of these pre-made, especially when you consider the difference in price between buying all the components and doing it yourself versus actually just buying one uh, out of the box. Uh, but look, if you're the sort of person that enjoys a bit of a challenge, it's definitely a rewarding thing to do. But look, as I said at the start of the video, make sure you do subscribe to the AM Studio channel as well. They're not affiliated with me in any way. I haven't actually even ever even spoken to the guys, but I do find their videos really interesting and useful. So check them out. They've got a bunch of DIY videos over there. But as for this video, if you've found it useful and interesting, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell as well so you don't miss the next one. Obviously, we've still got a bunch of stuff to cover in this series about PC sim racing. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.